time, I will, I think we are ready to start. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Liz Kamp. So she's professor of philosophy at Rutgers University. She works in philosophy of language, on lots of exciting topics from metaphor, irony, sarcasm, and pejorative slurs, conceptual framing perspectives. And so um, I think uh, I would just leave the floor to you. Okay, I just realized that I need to drop uh, my um, handout into the chat. Uh, and so I've done that. Um, uh, okay, so so thank you, Mihailin, lovely to see you. Um, uh, I would thank you, Jillian and Bianca for having your um, cameras on. If like a cut and Mihailin, so just a couple more cameras would be, uh, you know, we can feel like I have no who I'm talking to and that would be really, really nice. Thank you, I appreciate it. That's good, that's good. Yeah, I mean, if I was to do that would be good, but um, okay. So thank you, <laughs> nice to see you. Um, uh, I, um, so I just put the, uh, my, um, handout in the chat. I reject screen sharing. So, uh, I will be using the handout. You'll need the handout, but, um, uh, you know, but, um, I will not be on the screen itself. Um, so what I want to talk about today is, uh, I want to talk about, um, a range of phenomena, which we are specially frequently talk and think about now in terms of slurs and generic terms, but which is part of a broader category. Uh, and I wanna to try to explore why it's both such a powerful um, category of uh, um, modes of representation for thinking and for communicating, why it has the sort of really um, pernicious effects that uh, we see with especially slurs, but also uh, push back against a kind of line that it is therefore um, always pernicious and to try to think about what the potentially liberatory effects of this, these ways of thinking and talking can be. So, um, Lots of our representations, more it seems like, you know, as we think this through uh, systematically, lots of our representations center social. Oh, and before I start, right, this, um, the word center made me think of this. This is joint work with uh, Carolina Flores. Um, and so this is very much, uh, you know, um, a, a product of our work together, of our joint thinking. Uh, she's the person who started using the word center. I wouldn't have used the word center uh, a couple of years ago. So she, you know, she's, she reminded me. Um, so lots of our representations center social identities, really focus on and put uh, social identity at the um, focus of conversation and thought. Um, so lot, uh, uh, one example that has gotten a lot of philosophical attention recently is generics um, uh, with phrases like boys will be boys or sentences like boys will be boys or women are empathetic or girls suck at math. Um, also lots of uh, attention to slurs. Um, uh, I'm not even gonna say them, they're here and you know I can token them if it's useful, but I don't think it's that important here. It's also, I think, important to see that this is uh, this kind of uh, identity centering um, representation is not exclusive, exclusively linguistic. Um, so another range of kinds of phenomena that we're all super, super familiar with are tropes. And here I've just picked a few um, sort of movies that exemplify sort of that center social identity in this kind of way. So Rebel Without a Cause, the sort of um, uh, young tough guy rebel, uh, um, and James Dean, um, Revenge of the Nerd, sort of the stereotype of the nerd, uh, Pretty Woman, the trope of the sort of happy prostitute waiting to be liberated by the right man. Um, these are sort of ways of thinking, construing, constructing social identities that are very powerful and that regulate our thinking um, and that we use to coordinate and communicate in a wide range of ways. So as lots of people have uh, sort of noted, these representations are cog cognitively and communicatively powerful. And what's so frustrating is a even for people who um, don't want to, uh, for who, who reject the sort of framing, the, the mode of thinking that is associated with these, um, they're especially powerful because they essentialize the social group in question and uh, um, make it seem as if uh, that is the social kind is the defining feature for individuals who belong to that group. 
So this essentializing phenomenon um, makes them resistant to falsification from factual counterexample, pointing out that somebody uh, actually performs, a woman actually performs fairly well on um, quantitative performance tasks or um, that a boy, you know, it's um, boys are likely to, uh, to you know, uh, they're not disproportionately unlikely to cry in certain situations or that um, women are perfectly capable of doing other kinds of jobs besides uh, ones that are uh, deeply involved with empathy. That doesn't falsify the general claim. It's sort of, it's just um, it, the es essence remains even if the su superficial features uh, are not always instantiated. Um, sort of at a deeper level, um, uh, part of what the work of essentializing does is make clusters of observed features seem normal. That's so like the way things should be. They're uh, often seen to uh, felt to sort of uh, uh, emanate from a natural underlying robust essence um, and therefore to be justified. Um, so if you don't display a member of that social kind doesn't display those features, then they are in some sense abnormal. They're not behaving the way they should. They're not conforming to a standard that is appropriate. Um, and then because these ways of thinking, these essentializing ways of thinking are present in our, um, not just in our own minds, but in our cultural currency, especially as demonstrated by the conventionalization of these uh, social kinds in, you know, socially language loaded, in loaded language like slurs, but in other kinds of constructions as well in movies and everything. The fact that they have so much cult social cultural currency um, that makes them powerful tools for enforcing so the social structures that go along with those social kinds. So I think we can see sort of, I mean, that was super, super fast. I'm just reminding you of things that you all already know, but that is enough to, I think, remind us why these are um, pernicious and powerful modes of speech and talk, right? Um, and so part of what I would do is try to understand a little bit more why they have these effects and why um, it, uh, we let this happen so that we have these kinds of words and these kinds of tropes in our you know, cultural currency. Um, uh, and also though, I more importantly, I wanna say um, the fact that they perform in this way is not always a bad thing. Essentializing frames, ways of thinking and talking that essentialize are not always an inevitably pernicious and oppressive. They really can be, but they needn't always be. So in order to do both of those things, to help us understand more about what uh, essentializing frames do that makes them so powerful and pernicious, and also to see why they need not be pernicious, I want to locate them within a larger um, genus of what uh, framing devices and think of what's distinctive about them in particular. Um, and part of what I want to do here is the larger genus is um, constituted, it's broader in that it's not just ways of thinking and talking about social kinds necessarily. There are other kinds of um, other domains besides social categories that we also bring this kind of thinking to bear on. Um, and also they're not always um, essentializing, frames need not always be essentially, essentially essentializing. Um, and then the other thing that I think is sort of part of what I wanna push is that it's not just, so we, when, if we just focus on say slurs um, or even generics, um, I think that it's easy to think um, that this is just a matter of sort of uh, automatic uh, um, stereotyped thinking. And a part of what I wanna do is draw a connection between that kind of uh, cognition that we see in the operation in the case of slurs and um, stereotype loaded tropes, but also connect that to the kind of intuitive thinking we find in like the most refined uh, and developed art, uh, especially narrative art, poetry, um, but also non-linguistic art and also in the practice of science. So I'm only gonna gesture at that, but that's part of what I wanna do is locate this larger genus. Okay, so to do that, I gotta give you a super quick tour through my sort of way of thinking about the idea of a perspective. And so I'm talking about these 
uh, essentializing frames, these ways of talking and thinking like generics and slurs and tropes and movies. Um, I think of them as frames. Um, and so I need to explain what I mean um, by that. So a frame, as I understand it, is a representational vehicle that guides interpretation by crystallizing and expressing a perspective. Um, and so it's a way, it gives us a tangible touchstone for expressing an evocative, open-ended uh, interpretive way of mode of interpretation. So I'm going to say in a moment more about what I think perspectives are, but just to have some other examples besides of framing devices, besides generics and slurs and um, stereotype tropes. Um, thick terms and metaphors uh, are, I think, also devices that are designed, linguistic devices that are designed to frame their topics in a rich perspectival way. Uh, we also often use mantras and slogans. Um, so here I've given you some examples, minds are computers, uh, as a sort of regulative principle for making sense of a whole domain, the mind. Um, Black Lives Matter is a slogan for making sense of and advocating for an understanding of uh, a certain very large swath of social interactions. Um, and um, hashtag blessed is a way of sort of expresses a vote as a touchstone for thinking about how we should be like, you know, one should construe and engage with the world. So those are mantras and slogans. And then we also have not, again, non-linguistic devices that do some of these same kinds of things. So the Ruth Bader Ginsburg necklace is, it has become a sort of icon, which uh, crystallizes and evokes a way of thinking about um, uh, what it, how one uh, uh, engages in uh, social debate and uh, tries to make social progress, say. Um, the pride flag and the thin blue line flag, right? Those are flags, they're symbols, they evoke and serve as touchstones for very different modes of uh, perspectives and modes of control. Okay, so frames are representational devices that uh, uh, serve as touchstones for articulate and express and crystallize perspectives. What are perspectives? A perspective, as I understand it, is an intuitive disposition to interpret. Uh, it's a, into a disposition to notice, connect, and notice phenomena in the world, connect those phenomena together in certain kinds of ways, and thereby to respond to it. So uh, first, uh, perspective sort of regulates our attention. Uh, at the domain that we're engaging with. Uh, focus in, is, focuses on information of certain kinds. First, by parsing sort of just the manifold uh, range of phenomena we encounter into certain kinds of repeatable categories. Um, and then by selecting those, uh, some of those uh, features and uh, allocating more or less uh, attention to those. So uh, uh, a perspective presupposes a taxonomy um, what it tells us what counts, it determines what counts uh, at all and what it counts as. So as we encounter things in the world, we encounter them as instances of certain kinds of categories. And some of those categories matter more or less to us for different kinds of reasons. Um, uh, a taxonomy itself uh, presupposes a kind of statistical profile of distribution of lower level properties in the world. So how things are clustered, how common they are, um, and how they're uh, connected to each other, homeostatic clusters of properties. Um, and a taxonomy also presupposes a certain set of values, what you should care about um, and what you should be prioritizing. There's a lot more to say about this, but I'm just gonna say, you know, so attention, a perspective sort of regulates our attention in terms of a set of uh, assumptions and values as embodied in a presupposed taxonomy, what counts and what it counts as. So we, notice things in the world, we pay more or less attention to them relative to this perspective. And then a perspective also allows us to connect the things, the various manifold things that we uh, notice and pay attention to into not just our lists of phenomena, but or lists of features that things have, 
but into complex holes. So uh, there are lots of different ways of connecting. Um, uh, uh, we have, so we connect things into networks of centrality. There are lots of different bases for connecting features. Uh, you know, we th take one thing to have caused another, one feature to cause many other features uh, and some to be more marginal. Um, we think some features are just correlated or we think that some features imply materially or logically other features. We also connect features on grounds of sort of moral or aesthetic or evaluative, emotional, other kinds of evaluative grounds. So I think often, and this is something that we'll, uh, I could talk about more uh, and it may, will come out a little bit later. So often we just simply have an intuitive association between the features that we notice and attribute to a given subject. Um, and then we sort of look for grounds that would justify that intuitive connection, right? And so uh, we will really like it when we think that one thing causes another feature, but um, sometimes it's just, we just feel that they belong together. And then we sort of look for a basis for that. Um, we retrospectively reconstruct uh, a basis for it. Um, and so then given that we've paid attention to the world in certain kinds of ways, we've noticed certain parsed it and attend, uh, uh, of uh, prioritize certain kinds of features, we've connected them into a certain kind of uh, complex whole, then on that basis, we uh, evaluate, we respond to those features in certain, to that, those subjects in certain kinds of ways. Uh, we have moral responses, we have emotional responses, we have practical responses, we have aesthetic responses. So um, modes of response, uh, different people who have different perspectives on a domain are gonna respond to that same a uh, set of data coming in in very different ways. Those different responses will be can be warranted for each of those different parties precisely because they have parsed and attended to and uh, explained those disparate phenomena in different kinds of ways. So I understand that that was like, you know, a really fast thing. I want you to sort of just, that was my way of saying uh, trying to spell out in a little bit more detail something I take it you're all already familiar with, which is the way in which different people have different intuitive perspectives on the world, which they bring to bear, um, and which lead to very different patterns of attention, uh, patterns of interpretation. Um, as I understand it, a perspective is, uh, uh, it regulates, as I've been talking, it talks about, as I've been talking about it, it um, explains how, and the ongoing dynamics of how we engage with the world, sort of how we take in information, process it, and respond to it. Um, perspectives, so they're, they're dynamic. What they produce are mental representations, um, uh, complex multiple representations, which I call characterizations. So a characterization is a perspectival construal of a certain subject, right? A perspective is like a way of encountering a certain mode of the whole part of the portion of the world. And uh, a characterization is a way of thinking about a particular thing, right? So you might imagine um, sort of a very a family centered perspective on, um, uh, on social dynamics. Um, and then that might manifest among other things in a certain characterization of women uh, in terms of their potential and fulfillment of certain kinds of views about motherhood. And then that might in particular, that specific uh, characterization of women and maybe of mothers might eventuate in a specific construal of a specific woman, right? Who say Jill, who happens to be a mother. Um, so a characterization is a perspectival control. Um, it, it takes a really complicated, you know, often very rich cluster of features, structures them into the a network of uh, more or less important features, which are uh, explain each other and hang together in an intuitive way. Um, and it often includes really um, highly vivid and affect affectively loaded, emotionally loaded um, uh, features. So again, thinking about you know, a representation of a particular woman as a mother um, that uh, uh, is often going to include sort of, you know, images, maybe, you know, of a, a, a caring embrace and, uh, you know, emotions of uh, safety and maybe oppressiveness, depending on your view. Um, so stereotypes are our most um, common and powerful instance of characterizations. Um, there's something I think we're all highly familiar with. Part of what's important to me is that stereotypes are just one 
element. They're just one uh, species in a larger genus, right? So um, the I think of my this notion of characterizations, which I'm talking about, which I hope is sort of familiar to you uh, in life, if not in the terminology. Um, I think of it as very close to what a lot of psychologists mean when they talk about concepts. I think that's different from what philosophers often mean when they talk about concepts, because philosophers often mean sort of reference determining compositional bits. Um, it, whereas what I'm talking about is much more rich and more like a stereotype or a prototype. But also it includes um, characterizations. We have characterizations of culture-wide kinds like women or mothers, as I've just been saying, but we also have um, characterizations of highly individual things, um, topics, particular events, particular individuals. Um, and we also have where stereotypes are culturally shared, they're culturally ubiquitous, I take it. Um, I have my own particular characterizations of particular things, right? So I have a characterization of um, the woman who used to uh, sell, you know, co the barista around the corner when I used to like go out and buy coffee, I, I don't buy coffee, but buy tea. Um, and that's not, there's not a stereotype of her, but I have a particular way of thinking about that particular individual, which synthesizes a rich range of phenomena uh, and in this kind of structured way that I was talking about, regulates my attention, how I understand her. Um, okay. So that's this. Uh, so so what we have are we have frames, which are representational vehicles, which express perspectives. Perspectives are intuitive modes of construal, like sort of open-ended dynamic ways of construing a range of phenomena. And they produce at any given moment, in a given context, a characterization, which is a complex way of thinking about a particular subject, which attributes to it a complex cluster of features. Um, so perspectives and then because of that frames and characterizations, as I understand them, they're related to but different from propositional attitudes as those are standardly understood. So the first thing which I've already sort of said is that perspectives are open-ended tools for thought rather than thoughts per se, right? They're ways of construing, uh, they're sort of principles of, for interpretation rather than being specific sets of commitments to how things are. This is part of what makes them especially sticky across like, uh, you know, data as it comes in, right? They're ways of, their their underlying ways of making sense of data, they're not themselves data, right? And so you can give me a bunch of data, you can give me a bunch of facts about a particular individual or about a group, a kind, um, and that may influence, it may sort of bump up against my perspective, um, but it needn't dislodge it because um, uh, it needn't falsify it because the perspective is just a way of, it's a way of taking in and making sense of information. It's not itself a piece of information, right? And so it can uh, accommodate various pieces. Often it can accommodate various pieces of information in particular ways. Um, but character, perspectives do produce characterizations. Characterizations do have contents. They're, they're class, attributions of clusters of features as I've talked about them. Um, but even those are uh, different from propositional attitudes as traditionally understood, because there's something, they're intuitive construals. There's something that you actually have to get. You actually have to get a characterization in order to, for it to play the right cognitive role, the right functional role in a way that you don't have to get a propositional attitude like belief. Um, so what do I mean by that getting? about it being an implemented disposition. So, so a perspective is an implemented disposition to form and update cognitive structures, characterizations. And um, here I like to always use this, um, you know, little old lady, young lady figure, which is on the handout. Um, here, I think this, the idea of uh, implementing a gestalt in perception or in cognition is really helpful. So. Um, when you get the uh, figure as a young lady, it all the pieces fall into place in a certain kind of way. You see it in that way. You might be able to do that and not be able to see it in the other way. Usually with a group of people, uh, what are we, uh, almost 40 people, you know, there would be like 10 of you who couldn't see it one way or the other. You're trying but trying, and yeah, I got the right concept, but tr trying to apply the concept doesn't suffice. It helps, but it doesn't suffice to actually get the uh, structure in the relevant kind of way. 
And sometimes uh, that way of seeing can come in on, you can intrude on your thinking sort of unbidden, un unwillingly, right? You see something in a certain way, although you would rather not. Um, so this cognitive structuring that actually, in order to get a characterization, in order to get a perspective, you have to actually structure your thinking in the relevant way at an intuitive level. And that is something that is partially, but not entirely under voluntary control. It's something you can try to do, something you can uh, mm, uh, uh, bring information to bear to help make happen, but where nothing uh, that you do is guaranteed to succeed. Um, and in addition, explicitly entertaining and endorsing the appropriateness or the inappropriateness of that perspective or that characterization, again, is not, uh, is neither necessary nor sufficient for actually having it implemented or not, right? So you can endorse that this is the right way to think about. So you can say, ah, yes, uh, you know, um, uh, my colleague is, a, you know, a leading um, expert in the field, and yet I never really accord her the respect she, you know, I think that she deserves, right? So my intuitive mode of construal, my intuitive may, way of taking in and processing and responding to information um, is not, does not always fall, follow in tandem with my explicit uh, endorsed uh, commitments. Okay, I think this phenomenon of being intuitive in a way that is partially but not entirely under voluntary control. I think that's really sort of theoretically interesting and also incredibly powerful um, uh, in social, sorry, in cognition in general and in social cognition in particular. Okay, so that was my super rapid fire tour through what I mean by a frame and why I think these uh, linguistic expressions like generics and slurs, but also a range of other kinds of phenomena are so powerful co uh, cognitively because they harness these deep intuitive, ubiquitous uh, deep intuitive modes of thinking, which are really, I think, very important for our everyday engagement with the world. So now on the other side of the handout, on page two of the handout. So I think what we can now see is that essentialist frames in particular, are powerful tools for social cognition and social coordination because they offer really simple, accessible principles for interpreting and regulating complex nuanced phenomena in real time. So social phenomena are super complicated. People are super complicated. People in their social interactions are super, super complicated. Having a, um, a, a, a single defining feature and essence which allows you to make sense of that kind of very rich range of uh, phenomena in real time by giving you a principle for what you should pay attention to, how you can explain it, and then um, how you should respond to it. That's something that's really useful. Um, and uh, we need something like that in order to just make our way through the world in real time. Um, I can, and then communicatively, I can give you a lot of information about a particular individual, um, about sort of a whole situation by evoking these complex essentializing kinds, right? They, they package a huge amount of information. I can say, all you need to know about her is that she's one of these kinds of, one of these instances. Um, they also really facilitate social coordination because they give us principles for forming expectations and responding to expectations about each other. They give us ways of um, going along to get along. I know you're gonna look at me as a woman. And so therefore that gives me an efficient way to sort of predict how you're likely to respond to me. And then I can just sort of, uh, that gives me an efficient way of channeling and sculpting my own behavior as a way of focus, you know, cause I don't wanna think about all that, you know, I don't wanna to have to spend all my time. I can't uh, spend all my time triangulating on all that complexity. I need to be coordinating in real time on this other phenomena. So just going along with these social kinds and these as encapsulated in frames gives me, gives all of us powerful tools for sort of packaging information in ways such that we don't have to always be processing it all and coordinating it all together all the time. So that's what's common across essentialist frames. They give us these simple principles for uh, you see, especially the ones that are um, uh, uh, 
principles that are manifested in observable properties like skin color or body shape. Um, those give us simple accessible properties for uh, principles for making sense of extremely complex data. So that's something that's common across all essentialist frames, I think. But the next thing I want to say in order, so that's, and then we can see why they're so powerful. Now I want to turn to the sort of second part of my uh, brief, which is they're not all the same and they can work differently in very different ways and therefore be liberatory as well as oppressive. So we can see given the kind of power that they have cognitively, communicatively, how they can be oppressive. But we can also see how they can be non-oppressive, right? We've seen they're necessary and it maybe we'd have a sort of double-edged sword, right? Well, they're oppressive, but we got, we need them. They need not be oppressive also, right? So that's part of what I wanna, that's what I wanna turn to now. So to do that, I wanna make a little tour through ways in which even just specifically essentialist frames, not all frames are essentializing, but even those that are essentializing, even those can vary in really important ways, both across the kinds of domains that they apply to and across the different agents who use them. So first of all, a frame can um, extend more or less robustly beyond belief. It can be a sort of uh, fairly intellectualistic, fairly narrowly grounded in a range of beliefs or commitments about how things are, or it can really imbue your um, perception and action and emotional responses in very deep and persistent ways, right? So it can um, play a richer or thinner role in how you parse actions, right? I, um, there's, you know, classic uh, psychological studies that the same sort of uh, physical, spatio-temporally physical gesture can be interpreted as hostile or playful, depending on who makes it, the gender, especially the race of the individual who performs it. Uh, so there we have a social kind, which is uh, where differences in social kind are imbuing perception in certain kinds of ways. That's a case that shows sort of how powerful race and gender are in our constituents, but not all essentialist kinds are like that. I don't think that necessarily uh, uh, for many people, the um, uh, framing, the, the thinking about Asian Americans is not, or Asian people is not sort of as perceptually robust in that way. Um, uh, I think it's important here to see like how rich a range of phenomena get parsed and understood in this way. So it includes like vocal contours, hairstyles, ways, modes of dress, hand gestures, how close you stand people, all of these kinds of very low level phenomena get parsed in terms of social categories in these ways. Um, but some of the categories we use really, especially uh, gender, really you know, penetrate deeply into perception, others less so. Um, Essentialist frames also vary in how, in similar kinds of ways, in how they regulate attention and recall, like how much they dominate our mode of thinking about uh, individuals we encounter. Um, and then how, in terms of response, how robustly do they dominate our emotional aesthetic responses, right? So uh, we see this especially with slurs, especially with feelings of contempt for those who fail to conform um, or uh, those who do conform to uh, uh, um, subordinating uh, kinds. We also see it in like the kinds of what, what we find, what uh, to appropriate a phrase that I think is really appropriate from um, Jason and David's work, um, uh, the sort of resonance of certain kinds of uh, frames in particular, right? So what's funny? What do you sort of, what seems apt? What do we get um, even despite ourselves, right? You know, the uh, Hollywood you know, traffics in tropes for a reason because they work on us at a deep intuitive level and they allow them to set up narratives and particular stories that are useful. So um, the, these essentialist kinds um, entrain our emotional aesthetic responses more or less richly depending on the kind of kind of frame they are. Um, okay. Essentialist frames also vary in how robustly they're anchored in uh, beliefs. So are they sometimes, uh, many people are tempted to think of them as deeply innate, but we also have ones where yeah, you're not really committed to that. You just think it's a product of how things are in the world uh, right now, contingent social structures, but still it regulates your thinking. Um, 
also how uh, how wide a range of what you're talking about, uh, what you're thinking about, does the frame regulate, and um, and how robust are the um, evaluative responses you have? Does this really determine how you think people should respond? Or he happens to be in that category, and that's okay. It's up to him. I, I expect this, but you know everybody can do what they want. Different people uh, feel differently uh, or employ flame frames with different degrees of normative force. Now moving sort of outward um, and toward more of the social uh, dimensions of frames. Um, frames also vary in the stance with which individuals deploy them. Um, so some people deploy flame, frames in highly rigid ways, sort of every woman they encounter, or you know, they sort of apply the, their um, framing device for their, say, the, the category of womanhood to them and maybe the expectation of motherhood to them and uh, sort of in a ubiquitous way across contexts. For other people, there have to be socially, sort of contextually specific triggers for a particular frame to get it to be operative in their intuitive thinking. Um, people also vary in how persistent they are in deploying a frame in the face of sort of countervailing, apparently countervailing evidence? Do they insist on accommodating the evidence to the existing frame or do they shift to a different frame? We also, as I've already said, sort of vary in the kind of endorsement that we have toward these frames. For some people, they're reflectively endorsed, right? They deep, they reflect deep commitments to how they think the world is and should be. Um, for other people, they um, intrude on us unbidden, even though we reject them. Right, so I am susceptible to a range of uh, ways of thinking, perspectives, ways of thinking about social kinds involving especially maybe obviously gender and race um, that I wish I weren't competent in, but I am competent in, but that, and that can be triggered in me. So stereotype threat is the great example of that. Um, and they also vary um, in terms of uh, whether, and this I think is really important, whether the frame is has been imposed on the individual in quest who's using it by a sort of, um, uh, by somebody else or whether they have generated that um, uh, label for themselves uh, in application for themselves. So have has it been triggered in me or have I marshaled it? Um, and so that starts to lead us toward really the, the sort of the, the social dimension. So frames also vary in how powerful, how efficacious they are in social construction and in social distribution. So some frames like uh, the category of womanhood or maybe mother are really hegemonic. They dominate a wide range of contexts and uh, they reflect power structures that are really um, have a lot of institutional entrenchment. Others are so subcultural, right? They're proprietary to the subcultures. So a good example of this are you know, the manifold um, subcategories within various kinds of gay culture, right? There are lots of different subkinds. Um, those can be used in sort of um, uh, essentialist ways, but they are um, sort of originate and uh, or belong to that uh, subgroup, those subgroups. Um, Frames also vary in, in this essence, the essentializing perspectives that go along with them also vary in terms of how robustly they have been codified by institutions. Um, you know, are they ensconced in apartheid law or are they, um, that's the, you know, one extreme. At the other extreme, we have extremely subtle, nuanced ways of regulating and responding to violation of expectation in, um, here. So sort of the kinds of, you know, um, uh, the, uh, it, so what kind of look you get from somebody, a brief glance, right? Um, the ways in which, what sometimes, you know, thinking about the gaze, right? Uh, different kinds of gazes that we uh, give and receive to each other. Um, we get that information about have I violated expectation? Am I conforming to expectation of these social kinds? We get that information at very low levels um, uh, all the time. And that sets us up to respond in certain kinds of ways. Um, but it is also, uh, so, um, uh, so, but it's not institutionalized in any robust way. Um, so that kind of, those kinds of, uh, um, feedback that we get in terms of more or less subtle responses from others set up a kind of looping effect where we uh, have an incentive to conform 
and also to deploy these ways of thinking, these kinds for understanding others. So we ourselves to conform and to understand others in these terms. And that produces a kind of looping effect, which can um, enforce and strengthen this, these ways of thinking uh, about these essentialist kinds. So, and again, frames can vary in how robustly they um, manifest this kind of ratcheting looping effect. Um, so uh, for, uh, in terms of regulating cognition, uh, a frame can have really robust looping effects in terms of confirmation bias, right? Somebody really takes in lots of information and takes it to confirm and sort of works very hard to take the evidence that they're coming, that as it comes into them to confirm this uh, essentialist kind that they're using. Um, or they might be more or less flexible uh, about using it. So confirmation bias has this kind of robust looping effect that can be more or less robust for different individuals. Um, and then um, as I've already uh, sort of touched on externally, uh, there can be more or less robust mechanisms for rational motivation to conform uh, to these social kinds in, you know, to go along in order to get along, right? To use the existing social structures in order to um, fit into the social terrain as it's currently constituted in an effective way that'll allow you to do what you want to do. Okay. So if we look at this really wide range of ways in which different kinds of essentializing frames can, essentializing perspectives can be deployed in cognition and uh, social coordination and ways in which they can be ensconced in frames, that helps us to see on the one hand how they can be so pernicious when they take the form of, for instance, slurs or stereotypical tropes. Um, so frames which are other imposed, which have been institutionalized in robust formal ways, which are hegemonic across a society, which are deployed in rigid ways to all across contexts um, and regardless of the particular sort of evidence that's coming in, uh, which uh, impute a innate basis to the kind, um, which uh, radiate out to encompass a very wide range of um, kinds of information that somebody can have, uh, of, of properties that somebody can possess, um, that uh, regulate how people should be and uh, how we evaluate how they are. Um, and that actually don't fit with the ways that many of those individuals are. Frames that are like that are very powerful tools for oppression. Um, and I think that we see that especially with uh, racial and gender tropes. Um, uh, I think that the case of like mother is interesting, like intermediate. It's not always pernicious. It's not as robust, uh, but it's still very powerful. And then there are other frames which are much more um, sort of lightweight, uh, much less thoroughly ensconced and much less oppressive. So we can see how there is this really powerful pernicious effect. Um, but we can also, I think thereby see the ways in which we can't get away from framing uh, we need framing in order to engage effectively with the world as individuals and in order to coordinate. And so then the question becomes, what should we do with that? One way, a sort of easy thing to say, which I've said in other contexts, is that we should aim for flexible framing, right? We should aim to transcend the fixity of any particular sort of given frame and to embrace a multiplicity of frames. Um, so one thing, some advantages that come along with that are code switching, being able to navigate among frames um, gives us the ability to adjust to context um, and to effectively interact with others to understand what they're saying and to act toward them in a powerful, you know, effective ways. Um, it allows us to understand others, to engage in what Maria uh, Lugones calls world traveling. Um, 
It can also give me, if I have multiple frames at my disposal for engaging, uh, for performing my own life, but also for understanding others, then it can expand the menu of options I've got for understanding and engaging with others on any particular occasion. Um, and then I might thereby be able, we might thereby be able to create, you know, richer, more flexible, more, more richer, more nuanced frames that allow for um, integration of multiple sort of uh, ossified separate frames. That sounds great. I think that is often a good thing. But the thing that it's important, I think, also not to neglect is even rigidity is not always bad. Um, flexible, flexibility is not always good. So there are some distinctive strengths, cognitive and social, that can come along with having rigid framing, which centers uh, uh, social kinds and which does so in a fair, in a robust way, which we might be tempted to call essentialist. So as um, Kate Ritchie and Jenny Saul have argued, having these kinds of categories and seeing the sort of depth and and a robustness of their currency in regulating uh, social structures and regulating interpretation can be a really powerful tool for describing uh, and explaining and critiquing the existing structure, social structures, right? We need gender terms, we need racial terms in order to make sense of the complex phenomena as they are before us in the world, given that these kinds, uh, uh, even if they are socially constructed, have the power they do. More positively, um, we can also having these kinds of um, frames for identifying and participating in social kinds can help us to build solidarity and to consolidate similarities with each other as ways of uh, developing political and other kinds of power. Um, so we can help us to find others who are like us in ways that matter to us, and it can help us to identify ourselves in ways that make us easy for others to find and to affiliate with. Uh, it can also, having these kinds of labels, having these kinds of rich frames, um, can also help us in uh, appropriative revaluation of the social of the frames which are currently oppressive, right? So queer is the uh, sort of parade case for this kind of reappropriation. And finally, um, having this kind of uh, a, a rigid, so maybe even epistemically inappropriately rigid social uh, kind, frame for a social kind can help us as individuals um, by giving us a kind of persistence across the malleability of context that uh, we might uh, might cause us otherwise to just sort of shift into um, uh, the, you know uh, sort of accommodation to the current context. So it can give us a kind of aspirational resiliency. It can say, you know, I'm a I'm a doctor in training, damn it, and just because I failed calculus doesn't mean I don't belong, right? So having a kind that you identify with, even if it's not actually currently appropriate to you, can be a tool for sculpting yourself in ways that are um, ultimately to your benefit. Okay, so the bottom line is. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I just, my, one of my nice examples I really like for this is the construction of first generation students as an example of a social kind that groups are, um, that uh, can be an affirmative sort of uh, power, uh, social kind that can, you can sort of essentialize in ways that you might think are inappropriate, but can they have positive uh, beneficial effects. So bottom line, we shouldn't tar and feather all framing even all stereotypical framing, even all essentialist framing as pernicious and oppressive. Um, there's much more nuance here, both in the reality as it is currently practiced and in the potential for uh, um, social cognition and social coordination across uh, a range of phenomena. Thanks. Wonderful. So please, uh, questions um, and keep them short, focused, and I suppose the answers as well. <laughs> so, Emilia first. And yes, a uh, reminder put a J if you're a junior so that we give you priority. Go on, Emilia. Uh, th thank you so much. This was uh, fascinating. Um, so, I'm wondering about 
I think the idea of kind of correctly using frames is really interesting. I'm curious about this kind of uh, problem that comes up sometimes in ideology critique, where it's like, we're kind of reasoning from within this kind of value system. Yes. So in trying to critique it, we leave some parts there, yep. but then this kind of opens this critique of, oh, but you're still working within that bad system. Yep. Um, and I was just kind of wondering if you had anything to say about that kind of working within the frame, risking yep. kind of reinforcing that kind yep. of background system. Yeah. Well, I got a whole paper about that, but unfortunately I can't. Um, so I think that, so I was touching on this when talking about sort of the confirmation bias, the ways in which we're, you know, um, we're taking in information and it can sort of, uh, frames are self-perpetuating in this way, right? So you're taking in information in certain kinds of terms, you're already parsing it in certain kinds of ways, you're allocating attention to the things that seem appropriate to you, given the sort of terms that you're using, and then, uh, and you, the complex ways in which you can accommodate inf uh, evidence, they're so complex that you can sort of explain away or accommodate basically any data any way you want. So just briefly, I think that lead, can lead to a kind of complacency and myopia where everything seems great to you. It's not just that you're being lazy. Actually, rationally, things do. It, it really does make sense to you, given that you've already got a frame. But we always are already thrown within a, you know, a, a perspective. You can't, you know, you have to start there. So um, open-mindedness is a kind of antidote to that, right? You should try on, that's the sort of flexible framing, right? You can, should try on actively cultivate other frames to the extent that you can, which is always gonna be a sort of um, uh, degree, matter of degree, because you have to start from the perspective you have. Um, but um, that carries a commensurate risk of sort of seduction into some other frame, other, some other perspective, which now seems to you to be right. Uh, I think conspiracy theories often have this kind of flavor. And so, uh, so it's tough. Um, you know, so I think that there are, we should use reason and rationality and logic to try to, you know, do the best we can. But um, I think it really is a deep thing. I got more to say about it, but I will stop now. <laughs> okay. So next question from Cynthia. Oh, hi. Am I unmuted here? Yeah. I can oh. hear you. I'll turn on my mute. Sorry about that. So thank you. That was really interesting. I was just curious if um, you had anything to say about the connection between or difference between a frame and an ideology. So um, I, I want to be, I mean, so sure sounds a lot like the same kind of thing to me you know um what part of what i'm doing here is sort of saying but people use the term ideology they use the term schema they use the term script they use i mean there are many 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 terms that are floating around here people use them in a variety of ways and they also often have them take them to have certain kinds of entailments that i don't necessarily take them to have so part of what i want to do is just set up my own set of uh sort of commitments that i am um, ready to go with and then to you know so as i understand it i mean often an idea for some people an ideology is necessarily um uh has a kind of rigidity a kind of um uh and has a kind of um maybe inaptness right it's it's ignoring certain kinds of things uh maybe it has a kind of self-perpetuating self-justifying uh structure self-rationalizing structure that again, I want to say it can be, but needn't isn't at the isn't it, it can't is something we that it can often be the case. Um, that perspectives can have those kinds of uh, uh, features and they can be hegemonic and they can't, you know, have social cultural persons. Um, but they need not. And so I partly want to see those as like add-on, potential add-on effects. I also uh, think there's another thing, which is that I am approaching this as first and foremost, somebody in philosophy of mind who is thinking about cognitive structures and then working my way out to social structures um, that re manifest and reinforce those cognitive structures. And I think often people who are working in ideology, thinking about ideology are working sort of in the other direction. I don't think that's necessarily sort of oppositional, but it's gonna be a dip, maybe a difference in orientation. Great. Next is Julian. Hey, Liz. Um, hey. I'm interested in the idea of the rigid identity based framing being beneficial. And I can think a couple of ways that could go. And I was wondering if you like both of them as possibilities. So um, one is like uh, you take, you know, identities that have been uh, 
marginalized and you sort of use this to improve the, the I don't know what the word is, but the script or the perspective or the, yeah. so I was thinking like the hashtag black girl magic might be seen as an attempt at, at that kind yeah. of thing. Yes. Um, but a different way you could go is you can take your political enemies and write frames or perspectives for them that um, uh, make things harder for them. So um, the stuff that's associated with OK Boomer might be yes. a version of this, or yeah. like uh, perceptions of the Nazis during the Second World War as like a spider crawling across Europe and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like these kinds of associations. And like, um, I mean, I can certainly imagine somebody liking one way of doing it, not the other. And I yeah. wonder what you yeah. So first thing I want to say is like, you know, this is, and I want to say this in a range of things, like this is a two, so I'm giving you a diagnostic of a range of, of a phenomenon, right? Um, so there are these different rhetorical tropes and they do this thing and they have this power, you know, sort of communicatively and cognitively for these reasons. And that's just like an explanation of a phenomenon, which is a tool and tools aren't good or bad. They, it's all in how you use them, right? Um, so I, like I've written about metaphorical insults, right? Now the question is, should you be insulting the person who you're insulting, right? Uh, I can tell you why metaphors are good insults if you wanna be insulting somebody, but should you be insulting somebody? Um, so I could just do that. I could dodge your question by saying, I'm just giving you a tool, right? But I don't wanna do that. I wanna sort of say something further. One thing is, um, so so about the, so I do think this idea of like the other uh, other imposed versus self-generated label has is really important to like my thinking about the emotional valence of like, am I okay with the rigid identity base? You know, that really feels, and I think that has something to do with autonomy and um, sort of self-determination, right? So, so I think that that's, that's a big variant for me. Uh, and that is what I'm hearing in the two cases you were, you know, presenting. Um, but within that, there's sort of, so part of me wants to say like, every frame for a social kind is going to be in some way inaccurate because precisely it is a kind and it's essentializing it's leveling out difference among instances and that is never going to be a full reflection of the reality but i have a bit of a reaction a different reaction to your okay boomer and nazis as spiders examples and i think that's a great pair because on the okay boomer one i want to say oh well it might be instrumentally useful given how those people are acting in this context to have a rhetorical technique for fighting back against them but it's still inaccurate right and it's sort of uh there's a way in which it's not genuinely sort of appropriate even though it's instrumentally appropriate but then there's a way in which I want to, you know, say Nazis are spite. I would say, no, just in virtue of being a Nazi, in virtue of what Nazis are doing, this really is an accurate description, right? So, and it is a, a sort of a powerful tool for that. Um, so I want to say, I, what I'm hearing in myself there is I want to say sometimes the defining feature of the essentialist kind is so important that leveling out the differences really does, is warranted, right? Um, so that I think, uh, yeah, so that I think is an interesting, again, difference point. And I think I might be, my own reactions are reading in rich phenomena, you know, further phenomena into sort of the, the, um, the, the different cases. Um, the last just thing I want to say is I don't think, I, I do really want to say this thing about no easy answers. I think it's going to depend upon particularities of the particular cases, both what other interpretive options are available, how much power the various parties have, you know, so um, I don't think there's going to be a super general answer. Got it. Thank you. Last question from David. <laughs> I believe you're under the, we've had a lot of debates in my house about this, and I believe you're probably under the cutoff for Boomer. <laughs> I feel good. Uh, th thank you, Liz. Um, great talk. I've been thinking along parallel lines to you and very influenced by you also in the joint work with Jason for uh, um, like years. So this is great. Here's a question. Here's a ten some degree of tension that I sense. Um, both between your work and what what we're now doing with Jason, and and maybe within your work, maybe it's maybe it, maybe it's changing. Maybe I just didn't pick up on this. That um, a lot of the terms you use, uh, frame, perspective, and characterization, uh, can be taken to be about 
how we parse the world, if there is a world, I don't know, but how, uh, but on the other hand, other people talk about, use the term interpretation to mean what someone is doing when they present an interpretation, which ah, is not the yeah. usual way in a kind of analytic philosophy, but it's, it's mm -hmm. a, it is a standard way. And you ah. occasionally talk about dispositions, not only to interpret, but you yeah. talk about responding about, yeah. and it's not clear what responding, but it's not clear whether that includes actions beyond cogitating. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could say something about the extent to which you're couching what's going on in terms of our perceptions and interpretations understood passive, uh, um, not passively, but, but understood not in terms of at changing other people's views or doing things in the world, but yeah. in, in terms of our mental state. And to what extent do you think you need to embrace a more outgoing, behavioral, uh, active, performative uh, view, which of course is quite old in this area? Yeah, good. Uh, I'm sensing a kind of um, invitation to the latter. In the, uh, so, okay. So again, as I said, what, I, me? Uh, <laughs> so I'm a kind of, I am thinking about this first and foremost in terms of um, cognition. So you know, in terms of philosophy of mind. So I'm thinking about cognitive structures, dispositions to, so I'm thinking of perspectives as basically mediators of complex cognitive dispositions to form cognitive structures which mediate between perception and action and uh you know where perception is construed in really rich ways including you know all the kinds of high level ways we can take in information and action is construed in again very rich ways including all these kinds of affective um and uh affective response and also performative you know response uh, but i'm focused on the cognitive structures as like the thing that's what a perspective is um, in, so in that sense, I am embracing the first horn of your, you know, options. Um, uh, but of course, they don't come out of nowhere, right? And so the uh, I am a product of my society, and also I um, I manifest my uh, perspective willingly and unwillingly. I express myself, um, you know, all the time in low level and high level ways, right? And again, part of what I want to do is unite the sort of very low level taking in of information and um, uh, you know, low level interpretation, like sort of, you know, as I'm dealing with somebody on the street and high level interpretation when I'm in, you know, engaged in hermeneutic, uh, you know, uh, practice on poems. Um, but equally, I want to unite sort of the low level way in which I chose to do, you know, put on certain clothes and wear certain earrings and put my hair on certain way today, this morning, right? So the low level performance of whatever social kinds with high level sort of performance, uh, both reflective and under, unreflective. I want to say those are all manifestations of the same basic kind of um, yeah, manifestation, more or less willing, more or less reflective, but manifestations of a perspective, right? Um, I've been thinking increasingly, especially in um, terms of in aesthetic areas and thinking about fiction and other kinds of art about style. Um, and I think of style as like a performed analog of, um, of a perspective. Right, it's a way of it's a habit of action, a habit of performing, um, which is again partly but not entirely under voluntary control, which you know encompasses this wide range of things. Which I might have multiple styles, just as I might have multiple perspectives at my disposal. Um, so that's sort of moving into the more performative. I also have been thinking recently about so T Nguyen has this work on games, um, and he his key notion there is about agential modes. He thinks of games as sculpting and training us into agential modes, acquainting us with agential modes. That's a lot. It's like eerily love wonderfully parallel to what I think about the way in which fiction and other forms of art, um, for right. more what interpretive art, uh, T Nguyen. N-G-U-Y-E-N, okay. um, yeah. and the, he has a film review article, Games, The Art of Agency, and there's also, a, he had the book by the same title. Um, and so, so and yeah, you would be very much up your alley, I think. Um, and uh, uh, so, so I've been tangling a lot with that. And so that, again, is like a practical analog of the cognitive phenomena that I'm interested in. But I reject this, you know, 
individual versus social dichotomy that you, you know, are uh, inviting me to um, have to choose between. That, that wasn't the choice. It was really about <laughs> um, doing versus understanding. Yeah, yeah. And there I embrace the sort of understanding first, like I'm focused, I'm fo focused on understanding, but that cannot be understood apart from doing. Um, and uh, I do in virtue of my perspective and uh, that doing itself can be analyzed in commensurate terms. Thank you. Wonderful. So I will have a question, but I'm not gonna abuse my power and already so if everyone is happy we could take 10 minutes from now so we will be running five minutes late 